Oh, great, you're thinking. Another Turbinique video. As if the world needs another one of those. Right? Heck, this isn't my first dip into the Turbinique pool either. I did a piece on the famed Hassler's Hustler Altered, which won its class at the 1968 AHRA race at Bristol, Tennessee. I've also explored the company's history in audio podcast form, but I do have an admission to make. I was pretty ignorant. Like everyone else, I told the story the same way. Here's the wild product, here's the kooky stuff it did, and here's Gene Middlebrooks, the company founder and engineer, being found guilty in federal court. The end. Well, let's just say that up until today, there's been a lot left undiscovered, ignored, or just plain misrepresented in almost everything you've ever heard about Turbonique, and I aim to fix that. Hey everybody, Brian Loans here. Now, normally in my videos, I am heard and not seen for relatively obvious reasons, but today I want to talk to you about NordVPN. For starters, I want to thank NordVPN for being the sponsor of today's content, and I want to tell you how I use it in my day-to-day -day life to keep myself protected online from the bad guys. Now, when I go on a business trip, I do not leave my home unlocked for anybody walking by to simply cruise in and take whatever they want. And the same needs to be said for our data. The reason is, when I'm on business trips, I can be on four, five, up to six different public access Wi-Fi points doing the research for my YouTube videos during travel days. Whether that is at the airport or on airplanes themselves, at a restaurant, certainly at the hotel for an extended period of time. Now, these public Wi-Fi access points are super convenient to use, but they really do lack in security and the bad guys know it. With NordVPN, I can use Wi-Fi publicly and I can use it with confidence. NordVPN is gonna protect me from things like man in the middle attacks, gonna protect me from things like password attacks, malware, and various other bad things that the bad guys do. Now, it's super easy to use. I am by no means a huge techie, but I can tell you this. You download the app, you sign up, and you're in business and you're protected with that great peace of mind. You can go to nordvpn.com slash brianloans to sign up on an exclusive offer through my channel. This will extend your subscription by four months, and you'll also get the 30-day money-back guarantee that NordVPN offers to its customers. Now, you can protect up to 10 devices per subscription. For me, this means my laptop, my tablet, and my phone are all being protected by NordVPN, and that means I don't have to worry about my private information being exposed and accessed by those that don't have any right to do it. It'll also carry things like dark web protection and others where you get notification if your information starts to show up in places that are suspicious or it shouldn't be in the first place. That's nordvpn.com slash brianloans, and that's going to get you a four-month extension on your subscription as well as that 30-day money-back guarantee that NordVPN offers to its customers. Nord also offers other services like NordPass, which is a password protection service, as well as NordLocker, which is a cloud-style data storage that is also highly secured. So for me, NordVPN allows me to do my work, produce these videos, and understand that my data is protected and it's very easy to use. Lastly, if you're an international traveler and there are certain content you can't access from certain parts of the world you're in, you can choose your server so you can have that same viewing and content experience just like you were sitting in your own house and you don't have to miss out on anything. That's it, nordvpn.com slash brianloans. Get the offer today, protect your data, and keep everything secure. I do it, you should too. And now, Back to the video. The thing is, the story is always told with it being centered around the company and the stuff it was making. But that's not how this one's going to be told. We will explore the products, but this whole thing becomes way more fascinating when we focus on the man behind all of the madness. And there was way more than a decade of madness. His name was Clarence Eugene Middlebrooks. And Turbonique was not his first company, or his second company, nor was it the first one that landed him in federal court. Yeah, you heard me correctly. The conviction you know about wasn't even made in the same decade as his first time battling what were effectively the same charges when Dwight D. Eisenhower was president. Clarence Eugene Middlebrooks was born in Georgia in 1931. He was a student of exceptional brightness and had a very strong aptitude in math and science. This led him on an academic path through Georgia Tech, and he graduated with a degree in mechanical engineering. Now, most people are about 21 or 22 years old when they graduate college, so we're going to place him there as well. The young Middlebrooks got work at an engineering firm, and here's where our first massive revelation needs to be disclosed. By 1954, at the age of 23 years old, Gene Middlebrooks was in the speed parts and turbine business already. 
Now, working as a mechanical engineer at various local Atlanta firms, he was moonlining with a company he started and named Traco Products. So what did Traco Products sell? They sold electric automotive superchargers and standalone turbine engine kits. I have been able to locate magazine ads dating back to late 1954, and they continue with this company into 1958. If you were thinking he was working as a rocket engineer at this place, you'd be wrong, as so many people have been. But there's more on that coming up. The electric supercharger that he designed used a 4-horsepower rated electric motor that was from a Ford Starter. The design was a weird draw-through carburetor setup, and as you can see here, the starter motor turned a large vertical ring gear, which then spun a geared impeller, which spun and sucked the air through the carburetors. Now, in what would be a trend for Middlebrooks, the ease of installation and use were very much touted in his ads. These things could be bought fully assembled or in pieces for the home builder to complete. The price for a fully built supercharger was $149.50, which dropped to $99.50 if you wanted to build it yourself. There were very typical massive performance increases claimed, and the idea that this thing would be dormant until you decided you wanted to use it for short bursts of acceleration and very definitive language as to how good this whole program was going to be for your car. You don't need a race engine. You only need an electric supercharger that you can use just when you feel like it. But that wasn't the only thing Traco was selling. Their other primary product was, in fact, a turbine engine. How a supposedly complete turbine engine kit would sell for less than half of a supercharger kit is beyond me. Also, what's beyond me is what anyone would use the turbine engine for. And finally, the fact that people would want one in kit form in any volume seems like an impossible business dream, even for a guy like Gene Middlebrooks. Except it wasn't. We know this for a fact because in May of 1958, Clarence Eugene Middlebrooks was charged with mail fraud by the federal government. And yes, I said May of 1958. The government contested that the turbine engine kits were a collection of a few useless parts, the electric superchargers were ineffective and burned out car batteries within seconds of usage, and that Middlebrooks had taken in close to $80,000 between 1954 and 1958. Now that's on the order of about $900,000 today. The government was not messing around with their case. They had 50 witnesses lined up to hit the stand and testify that Middlebrooks was either misrepresenting his product or he was simply selling them with unworkably garbage parts. There were some cringy moments, like when questions regarding claims of Traco being a world leader in the industry with a large capacity for manufacturing was exposed as being, well, one man in his basement. But in this trial, Middlebrooks hired a defense attorney unlike he would a decade later, and this was one of the smartest things he ever did. His defense attorney worked over the witnesses, and according to newspaper stories of the day, he was able to illustrate that few of them knew anything about turbine engines or what they were buying. The argument that their ignorance should not be Middlebrook's problem kind of seems wild, especially with so many witnesses, but as the trial went on over a week's time, Traco Product's side was heard, and eventually the jury took it to deliberations. Incredibly, Gene Middlebrooks was acquitted on all charges. The jury deliberated for five hours before requesting some additional clarification from the judge, and they got those moments and that clarification, and according to the Atlanta Constitution, less than 10 minutes later came back acquitting Middlebrooks of all 13 counts he was facing. It started as 14 counts, but one was dropped before it went to the jury. Now raise your hand if you knew that age 27, Gene Middlebrooks owned the company that had beaten a serious slate of mail fraud charges brought on by the feds. I didn't think so. One more note on this trial and something that came up. Virtually every customer who purchased something from Traco was invited to become a dealer for their products. It didn't matter who you were or where you were, you got a dealer letter from the company. Now this was a way Middlebrooks hoped to raise capital and move more inventory for his burgeoning business kind of selling stuff that was kind of beyond questionable and had no hope of actually living up to the claims in his ads, especially the electric superchargers that would clearly have stopped the program dead in its tracks after the trial. No, actually with this guy, not a chance that didn't happen. In fact, as Traco Products was being laid bare in federal court as some sort of fraudulent enterprise, G. Middlebrooks was already into another business, a business he started before the trial and one that was right in his wheelhouse. The Oberhausen Supercharger Company of Atlanta was his next adventure, and you'll not be shocked to know what they were selling. 
electric superchargers. The Traco D500 dragster design was still for sale, and there were kind of other looks as well. He actually had an exhaust-driven turbocharger that was complete with flexi exhaust pipe hookups, hybrid electric and belt-driven units, and for the first time, he advertised pulse jet-driven and solid propellant superchargers. Now, Middlebrooks listed some 360 combinations that could be chosen from. The company existed from the close of Traco products right up to the start of Turbonique. It was during the Oberhausen period that Middlebrooks garnered himself a few patents. One was for an electrically powered supercharger with a couple of different layouts, and others were for improvements to turbine engines, mainly fresh designs for the actual rotors inside the engines themselves. Now, there is no evidence he actually employed these designs, but he did get them patented. As we can see with the electric and electric-assisted superchargers, they were all variations on the same theme. It was all in the method of driving a flat impeller that was adjacent to the plenum the carburetors fed. Whether this was done with one motor or two motors, or with the long belt-driven shaft and electric motor, all the stuff below the drive method was the same. Amazingly, one of these complete units came up for sale a few years ago, intake manifold and all. People refer to these as ray gun superchargers for obvious reasons. The ribs cast onto the exceptionally long snout of this sucker really give it that look especially with the helper electric motor on the back. The internal bronze gear drivers are cool to see, and the whole thing looks about as 1950s as any speed part ever made. Now, there is no record of these being objectively tested by anyone that I can find. If I go through my magazine collection and discover the late 50s supercharging stories in magazines, these are never mentioned. Oberhausen never comes up, and it's really never even suggested as an option for a customer. Now, that said, it doesn't mean people failed to buy them. I mean, newspapers of the era are filled with many, many classified ads from people who had bought them and used them, bought them and never used them, or bought them and simply wanted some of their money back as they knew Gene Middlebrooks would not be providing any of that anytime soon. And then I found this from 1959. Oberhausen actually went belly up that year. Unable to pay its debts and staggering forward, the company was doomed. And as we can see here... Middlebrooks was an evasive character when it came to deal with the courts and being served papers. He had been there and done that before, and this was not a guy who was going to do it again, so he avoided being served at all costs. By late 1959, the company was dissolved and a sale of all its remaining physical assets was held. As we can see here, we're talking about parts and pieces and cameras and cars and more. An entity called Army Surplus Sales of Atlanta bought the whole inventory of superchargers and parts. As we can see here, they claim to have grabbed more than 100 complete superchargers. Now, I don't even know if the Oberhausen Company had ever sold 100 in its short existence in 57 and 58. I'm not sure how those guys planned to sell any of the ones they had, but... One can only imagine how many ended up sitting in the shelf and then perhaps going into a dumpster. So, two companies closed, one federal trial won, and Gene Middlebrooks was not even 29 years old at this point. So what's a boy to do? How about become a rocket engineer? It was at this point that Middlebrooks got a job with the Martin Marietta Company working on the Pershing Missile Project. How do we know it wasn't before? Well, simply put, the Pershing Project started in 58 and achieved its first test firing in 1960, which lines up perfectly with the period between the closing of Traco and Oberhausen. It also explains why both his previous companies were in Georgia, and Turbonique was based in Atlanta. That's where the Sand Lake Missile Factory was, where Martin Marietta was based for this project, and where Gene Middlebrooks worked, Orlando, Florida. Now, the Pershing was a long-range, two-stage, solid-fuel rocket with about 500 miles of flight and a top speed of Mach 8. It weighed about 10,000 pounds and could pack a very large nuclear-headed punch if the need was ever called for, and thankfully that need never came. They were in service until the 80s when the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty was signed, and then they were all out of service and destroyed by 1991. But back to our man Gene. While working away at Martin Marietta, Middlebrooks was moonlighting on his own experiments. Mostly the idea of turning a microturbine into something that would be usable in any number of applications in the real world. And if you're wondering what a microturbine is, think of a turbocharger or a centrifugal blower unit as a microturbine. The turbocharger is driven by exhaust gas, the centrifugal supercharger by the engine's crankshaft. Now imagine that unit being able to function without the engine having to help at all. 
Middlebrooks was basically going to take the same style of machines used as fuel pumps and liquid-fueled rockets and turn them into standalone power units. While he was there for the Pershing Missile Project at Martin Marietta, Middlebrooks was assigned as an engineer to the Advanced Propulsion Department of the company. Now this means he likely had input on a load of different projects that were both solidly fueled and many that were likely using liquid fuel, which would come in very handy as he continued to develop his own project line in secret. Turbinique's big breakthrough came in 1963 when Science and Mechanics magazine put one of their 360 horsepower micro turbines on the cover of the magazine and effectively proclaimed it to be the second coming of the mechanical world. Outside of perhaps curing world hunger and disease, the guys at the magazine proclaimed these inventions to be incredible. The story made such a splash that it actually crossed over into newspapers of the day as well, and it really put the company on the map. It gave Middlebrook some standing, and it began what would be a wild five-year run for the company. So, we need to break down exactly what the company made, because the product line was a little more diverse than most people give it credit for. And before we do that, let's just clarify the fuel that all this stuff ran on. Turbine e called it thermaline, but in reality it was normal propyl nitrate. And this is a liquid that has a flash point of 70 degrees Fahrenheit. It is a monopropellant that can combust in the absence of oxygen, and it does not take too big of a mental stretch to think that Gene learned of its goodness while working at Martin Marietta and his advanced propulsion lab. You did not want to breathe this stuff. You did not want to taste this stuff. It was milky or kind of straw-colored in its appearance, and it was legitimate rocket fuel. Pure oxygen was used in the process as an igniter, but once the fuel was lit, the oxygen was basically unnecessary and the combustion chamber pressure would keep the oxygen from actually venting more into said combustion chamber. It was all about the thermaline, or as we know it as the scientific name, normal propyl nitrate during combustion. So, now that we know about the fuel, let's go to the hardware. First, thrust engines. And these are exactly what you think they are. A liquid fuel thrust rocket that uses virtually no moving parts. There was fuel, thermaline, or normal propyl nitrate, oxygen, which was used to get the party started, and basically a combustion chamber and nozzle. These, like all turbine products, were not throttleable. Once you hit the igniter, you had to hold on. The reaction would start instantaneously, and you'd be blasted off down the drag strip across the lake, or as it learned in a few minutes, perhaps over the Grand Canyon. These were the cheapest products that the company made and sold, and a 370-pound thrust motor that weighed 53 pounds was listed as having the equivalent of some 3,300 horsepower and could set you back $530. These were the rocket engines famously used by Captain Jack McClure when he first got his drag racing career started. They were also found in the trunks of full-size cars used as pushers at the top end of the drag strip, used in other small applications like motorcycles and boats. Guys are actually running low nines on go-karts powered by these thrust bombs in the middle 1960s. Next up were the line of auxiliary power superchargers. Now calling on his previous experience with Traco and Overhausen, Littlebrooks continued his obsession with using the free power to boost engines. In the most basic explanation I can give you, he took his small thrust rockets and rather than having the pressure from the combustion vent to the atmosphere, it was shot through a turbine wheel which spun an impeller that sucked air through the carburetors or blew it through the carburetors depending on what setup you had. This was effectively a rocket-driven turbocharger. Instead of the car's engine exhaust spinning it, the rocket-propelled exhaust was doing it. Now how fuel enrichment, timing, or anything else was adjusted for what would have been the most instant and violent application of boost in history, I have no idea. How the car drove normally while trying to breathe through all this stuff when you weren't punching the boost button, I have no idea about that either. What happened when you closed the throttle blades while the rocket supercharger was still doing rocket supercharger things? Also, no idea. The company claimed that with the simple addition of the Turbinique supercharger, a factory 430 cubic inch Lincoln would go from 320 horsepower to 1,000 horsepower, just like that. The recommendation was for use in bursts of 15 seconds or less. The company did recommend forged pistons, heavy-duty rods, and main caps for drag racing applications, and the catalog seemed to indicate that anyone who questioned the horsepower gains was just simply too dumb to understand how all this stuff worked. Turbonique also offered a second style of supercharger. It worked on the same principle as above, but instead of needing pressurized thermaline and oxygen, 
It was solid-fueled. You popped your solid-fuel rocket canister into this sucker, stuck a percussion cap in the top, and then pulled back the spring-loaded striker. When the time came, you pulled the trigger cord, the percussion cap would be struck, the fuel ignited, and you'd have a supercharger for as long as that rocket propellant decided to burn. No shutting it off, no making it stop. This thing was going to go as long as it was going to go, good, bad, or otherwise. Now, the burn was supposedly 10 seconds. And why was it 10 seconds? As the catalog states, most cars would already be going 100 miles per hour in that time, so it just only made sense to have it cut off after 10 seconds. The Olin Matheson Chemical Corporation of East Alton, Illinois, made the rocket canisters, and they were as safe and stable to ship by air, rail, or truck. Interesting how this thing had a safety pin like a grenade in it that needed to be removed so the striker could do its job and fire the unit off. Once lit, 2,000-degree gas was emitted into the supercharger at 1,000 PSI. It was vented out of its own exhaust pipe on the bottom of the blower. Yes, these were superchargers with their own exhaust pipe. Seriously. Next up are the microturbines with gearboxes attached. So we take the supercharger operation where the gas coming out of the rocket combustion chamber is shot through the turbine to spin the supercharger, and we modify it. Now the gas comes out and spins the turbine, but the turbine spins gears in an output shaft. So now we can actually power stuff like drive wheels or a propeller or whatever else we need horsepower and torque to spin and create mode of action with. These babies are more expensive, and they're available in three configurations for the buyer. Fully factory assembled, the 45 horsepower version built and shipped was $1,030. They went in steps all the way up to 1,000 horsepower, and that one, factory built, was $3,295. This was a huge sum in the middle 60s and enough to buy you a really nice car. Now, there was also a complete parts kit. Now, that came with all the nuts and bolts, and all the components were sent to the buyer to assemble. Now, this knocked the price down about a grand in the higher horsepower models. Thirdly, there was a raw casting kit. Now, this was a set of unfinished castings that came with no hardware, no gaskets, and even some of the parts weren't included. It was the cheapest way to go, but you kind of needed to be a machinist to actually finish the thing off for it to work. These kits were half the list price of the assembled units. The spec charts on these are pretty crazy. Looking at the horsepower and torque numbers, the rated turbine wheel RPM, their size, weight, and the gear reduction is pretty wild. These operated on the same thermaline and oxygen mix that the other stuff did, and the company provided the same number of questionable charts, graphs, and claims that they did for their other products. The company has all kinds of testing images and testimonial letters about the efficacy of their product, how skilled and advanced its workforce is, and the methods of which they use to build stuff. Incidentally, the peak workforce at Turbanique, according to legal documents, was basically five people at the height of the company's success. Now, the uses for these things are hilariously endless. Not just on paper, but in real life. Carts, snowmobiles, motorcycles, small airplanes, and more. They're just wild looking, but they all worked. The images of the carts using propeller power, the carts with chain drive performance that would carry the front wheels down a strip at 150 miles an hour, these were at best, I can tell, the company's bread and butter products. And as you can see, they were used in a myriad of different applications. They were also the things that landed the company in hot water, but we're not done yet with the product line. Finally, and most famously, we have the rocket axles, which is what most people know the company for. The first mistake most people make in understanding these specific things is failing to know that there were actually two models of this infamous product. The first was a 1,000 horsepower turbo booster axle. Now this is the unit famously used by Captain Jack McClure who drove the Sizzler Chevelle and Zach Reynolds in his famed Tobacco King Galaxy. Incidentally, the car was not named that specifically. It was just given that name in the Turbo D catalog so it kind of stuck over time. The critical thing to understand with this unit is that with a turbo booster axle, a car's normal engine could still be used and the machine could be driven around in that way. The drive shaft connected to the quick change style rear end, and in normal circumstances, you'd just drive around. There was a one-way sprag clutch that allowed the turbonique rocket portion of the program to just freewheel in normal driving. Now, when you wanted to be a hero, you placed the transmission in neutral, got your thermaline and oxygen system armed, and then you hit the igniter button and held on. Instantly, the rocket would fire, 
The exhaust thrust would spin the turbine to 80,000 RPM, and this would turn the gears which drove the ring and pinion, and you'd smoke the tires for a quarter mile, shooting 10 to 15 feet of flame out of the exhaust cone. McClure's car at some 3,600 pounds would run low nines at over 140 miles using the turbo booster axle. The second available option for axles was the rocket drag axle, and this was a race-only piece, and that's the one kind of most people understand and know about that powered a fleet of match racing cars around the nation. From the dragsters of Joe Mazza in New England to the famous U.S. Turbine 1 car fling trailer, there was the Pegasus Mustang, the Turbo Stang, the Turbine Dart, the Black Widow VW, the Boss Cat Unlimited Snowmobile, and loads of others. The Studnicker brothers had a funny car. There was the Lightning Bug, the Odyssey Dragster, and a whole lot more. Simply put, these things worked, and the people that used them made plenty of money proving that fact, match racing, and making exhibition runs around the nation on a weekly basis. The rocket drag axle was very close to identical in its operation as the turbo booster axle was, with one major difference. There was no provision for a drive shaft to enter the rear end at all. Cars that used this contraption were pushed to the starting line and then ignited, and they launched down the strip much like the hydrogen peroxide rockets of the later 1960s and early 70s. Now, the machines that ran the rocket drag axle were super light, had no engines in their regular engine bays, and were absolutely the fastest things that Turbonique powered. Some machines, like the Hassler's Hustler Altered, which I've done a video on, used the unit mounted in their nose, which was divorced from the axle housing. They would transfer the power to the axle with a drive shaft, the only one it could possibly accept. Unlike the booster axle that could receive both a forward and rearward means of propulsion, the performance of these cars really made the company famous. Between the show they put on and the fact they not only functioned, but they absolutely grabbed the public's interest. The scream and fire shooting out of the rocket plus the tire smoke was a show that really nobody had ever seen in the sport. As we know, they could actually work too well. The famed Black Widow Volkswagen made a handful of runs in Florida, match racing and tangling with the four-engine showboat of Tommy Ivo and increasing its performance into the low nines at 168 miles per hour. The company wanted the car to run even faster before sending it on a nationwide match racing tour, and that's when driver Roy Drew achieved 183, which ended up being bad news because it happened on what would be the final pass of the car in its history. He wrecked in spectacular fashion the Beatles' horrid aerodynamics finally coming into play, not to say that the thing was much fun to drive at 160 miles an hour either. Needless to say, the Volkswagen was not rebuilt, and it never had its national tour. So were there drawbacks to the unit? Yeah, there were plenty. The Thermaline was very expensive, and like all rockets, it used a pretty good helping every time it ran. The fuel was the equivalent of $35 a gallon in today's money, and it could be bought through Turbanique and a handful of other specialty chemical suppliers, but the stuff was not easy to come by. The second was that if a driver stepped off the igniter button and back on it again, it was effectively setting up a bomb, and that bomb of being pure oxygen and puddled thermaline fuel. It didn't happen often, but when it did, things went bad. Just ask the guys from Arctic Cat. This phenomenon was not limited to drag axles. It was true of any one of the company's products, as they all worked in the same manner. If the combustion chamber was allowed to relax and was then reignited, all hell would break loose. There was a safety measure built into the drag axles, and that was an RPM-related cutoff. If the engine saw more than 7,200 RPM of output shaft speed, and remember we have reduction gears that took the 80,000 RPM of the turbine and slowed it down, it would shut the whole thing off. Okay, it was supposed to shut the whole thing off. The guys with the wild George Barris-built three-wheeler known as TurboSonic learned its failure firsthand. The Turbonique unit oversped and then relit, blowing itself to smithereens on the starting line during a body-off test day at the drag strip. The car never attempted another drag strip run and was basically a showpiece that toured the country from that point forward. This image is the car blowing its engine at the starting line. 1964 through 1967 were the great years for Turbonique. The headlines, the match racers, the fact that in 1965 the AHRA created a class for these units gave them some validity. By all measure, Gene Middlebrooks was killing the game technologically and financially. Then, in 1967, a new name appears in the Turbonique lexicon. And that name is Evil Knievel.
Both in newspapers and in the company's catalogs, they tout the fact that Knievel will be attempting to jump the Grand Canyon on a Triumph motorcycle bolstered by two turbinique thrust rockets in 1968. The simple concept was to run toward a ramp at 120 miles per hour, engage the rockets to achieve 250 miles per hour, and then gently sail from one side of the canyon to the other. For a million reasons, this didn't happen. But we all know what Evil ended up doing about a half decade later, infamously. It's just wild that these two worlds actually crossed over for a hot minute. 1968 would be a very bad year for Turbinique, and an even worse year for our hero, Clarence Jean Middlebrooks. All those flashy magazine ads that were touting his products and achievements, they were being made by a Connecticut advertising agency, and Gene had kind of uh, failed to pay them. We're talking 22000 bucks in 1968 money over the span of about six months, and it only got worse from there. In June, the company was sued by Ken Knudsen, who had a Turbinique unit blow up in his car, injuring him back in 1965. In August, it was announced that a Florida company called Hydroski International was going to buy Turbinique outright, and they had formed a new unit of their business called American Turbine Company. Hydroski had acquired the rights to technology Lockheed had developed for military watercraft applications. They planned on going to business to make commercial boats with it. They were going to pay Middlebrooks not only for the company, but also for his continued employment to develop more and new marine turbine applications that they could use in their boats. They paid him $125,000 for all of it. Middlebrooks got the $125,000 in June, and by August, things had turned into an absolute mess. Hydroski filed a suit against Middlebrooks, alleging that he lied on the company inventory, and he'd been using the funds supposedly set aside for his work with their company for personal projects and endeavors. Now, interestingly, we know one thing. He and his wife, Ruby, spent $52,000 for 140 acres of land about 30 miles outside of Orlando in late 1968. And this land purchase is a very important thing to remember. So, being chased by the ad agency, being chased by disgruntled customers, and now Hydroski, things seemingly could not get worse until they did. In very early October of 1968, the newspapers carried the story of Gene Middlebrooks being indicted by the federal government on 21 counts of mail fraud. He pled innocent. The trial would take place in early 1969, and Middlebrooks would choose to represent himself as his own defense lawyer. He battled the judge, battled the federal lawyers, and he battled the witnesses. He had lived this program once before, 10 years ago on the Traco trial, the one that his lawyer had successfully argued for an acquittal, he was going to do the same thing. Now, some people say that Middlebrooks was out of his mind to represent himself, but hear me out for a second. This guy managed to argue the number of counts down from 21 to 16, and in doing so, he managed to plant at least a seat of consideration into the head of the judge. There's no saying that a real defense attorney wouldn't have got the whole thing thrown out, but the evidence suggests he probably wouldn't have. So this was a pretty legitimate victory for Middlebrooks, and as you'll see, it got even a little bit better for him after that. The issue at hand during the trial goes back to those three levels of kits and the micro turbines that we talked about. In the end, Middlebrooks was unable to supply the finished kits in the manner people expected. He was sending the, quote, complete casting kit to people who were ordering complete engines to assemble. Instead of getting all the parts, they were getting semi-finished parts that required a machine shop and lots of mechanical know-how to even make close to a working unit. G. Middlebrooks was convicted of mail fraud, and as you think you know, he went to prison at 37 years old. Plot twist. Gene Middlebrooks never set foot in a prison. He was given a suspended prison sentence, five years of probation, and ordered to make restitution to those who had been seemingly hoodwinked by his marketing tactics. Gene Middlebrooks would appeal his verdict multiple times through 1970, 71, and 74, and it seems as though the tactic here was to keep from having to pay the debts that he incurred during the collapse of the company. As he never went to prison, he either wanted to clear his name or simply not pay the piper, and I personally think it is the second. Also, it should be noted, he kind of kept on doing business in 1969. The guy published Hot Rotor magazine, which ripped off Hot Rod's front cover look, and he publicized the cars using his products, and he also continued to advertise their availability. That's guts, kids. 
the Hot Rotor publication, which was made by a company called Middlebrooks Publishing, was the last gasp for Turbonique, and really nothing was ever heard of the company after that. Middlebrooks seemed to be the victim of what happens to so many businesses when they want to scale up. He simply ran out of cash to cover the cost of growth. Banks were not likely to jump at the idea of loaning a guy money for an explosive rocket company, and he was effectively robbing Peter to pay Paul, and finally, in the end, he just ran out of cash. But this is not the end of the story. That 140 acres that he and his wife Ruby bought in 1968, which was apparently not in his name, or perhaps it was and was maybe one of the many reasons he kept appealing, is the next chapter in this story and one that would again find Gene Middlebrooks fighting tooth and nail for. He wanted to develop this land, which was basically in the middle of nowhere at this point, into a recreational park, a place where there would be cottages to rent, aquatic activities to pursue, and where people could vacation. The process of getting all the permits and approvals put together took a little time, but once he got it together, the most G. Middlebrooks thing of all time occurred. While beginning to excavate a depression in the land that he had bought to turn into a swimming area, he and his guys opened up what was thought to be the most prodigious natural spring in the world. It was moving tens of millions of gallons of water per day. He sunk steel pipes into it to harness the flow vertically and created two massive waterfall structures, and he gave the name of the park Wakiva Falls. Instant controversy followed. People were afraid he was diverting water from other areas, that he would deplete the water table below the town. No one knew if it was an underground river or a well or a spring. And, of course, Middlebrooks was right in the middle of it. The one thing Gene did know is that he had a winter on his hands and people started showing up in droves. The man-made falls flowed into the nearby Wakiva River, so it wasn't like the water was being trapped, and there was apparently a strong sulfur smell coming from it, which was blamed on all the natural material that was decaying underground, which had been freed up to outgas out through the pond and through his man-made waterfalls. In the 1970s, things actually were going well once the controversy calmed down around the park. He was making money, the falls were a great draw for attendance, and the explosion of the camping and RV culture at this time in history made the business boom. He actually had a sidewheeler riverboat built to cruise people around and have fun. He gave jungle tours and even decided to host a concert. Now, 2,000 people were expected, 13,000 people showed up, and it was a pure Gene Middlebrooks chaos disaster, and no more concerts were held after that 1977 event. In 1982, Middlebrooks reported the city of Eustis, Florida to federal authorities for failing to pay taxes on an RV park the municipality owned. He was hoping to benefit from a whistleblower law that got the whistleblower paid a portion of the unpaid taxes the IRS forced a delinquent to pay. As it turns out, the city didn't owe a dime, but credit for trying. In the mid-80s, the local and state governments converged on Middlebrooks over the wells, over the waterfalls, and over his water usage. They took him to court and argued that the water flow needed to be controlled or even shut off. Middlebrooks lost the early cases, but, as was his pattern, he operated for years and years on appeals. The battles went on through the 90s, as did the water flow, and the business was still healthy. Gene Middlebrooks died in 2005 at 74 years old. Earlier in his life, Gene's son had passed away when he was only 40 years old. Ruby Middlebrooks, his wife, operated the park for years following the death of Gene, and today, the Wakiva Falls RV Resort is as large as ever, and yes, one of those waterfalls is still flowing. If you've made it this far, I'm going to end with a question. What are we left to think about Clarence Gene Middlebrooks? Was he a scammer? Was he just a bad businessman? Was he an innovative hot rodder, a genius, a felon, a good guy in the end? What's your take? At times in the story, Middlebrooks is a guy impossible to hate. He's filled with vision and vigor. At other times, he's kind of detestable, taking money for things he clearly knew didn't work as advertised and then trying to weasel his way out of it. And then we're left with a guy who had an aquatic gold mine that people still enjoy today. I'd sure have liked to have met Gene. That conversation would have been amazing, whether I loved him, whether I hated him, whether it was good or whether it was bad. I'm Brian Loans. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe for more historical, weird, drag racing, mechanical, auto racing, 
and occasional screwball content.